Hi, my friends. Welcome to another episode of Makamba Life. My guest today is a distinguished, or should I say the distinguished, political economist, analyst, author, and the deputy chairman of South African Institute of International Affairs. Welcome, Moile Zimbek. Great to be here. Do you think the, the successes uh, that Africa is witnessing in parts like mainly of political leadership and uh, to a certain extent development in parts like Rwanda, uh, Tanzania, you know, Botswana, uh, do you think these successes are it's premature to, uh, to, um, to acknowledge them or <clears throat> do you feel uh, that the leadership you know, in those countries has taken root and they are headed in the right direction? Well, I, I think you have to look on, on a case by case. Mm. Let's say uh, Rwanda first. If, if I look at Rwanda, Rwanda has, gotten, has been through a horrendous experience of genocide. Uh, in 1994. So it's a unique country. There isn't really a similar experience of genocide anywhere else in Africa. So you can't describe Rwanda as a case study in Africa because nobody else has had the experience of, of Rwanda. So you can describe it as a success? As in a, some are calling it an you know, economic miracle well, I, I have a reasonable knowledge. I know Kagame. Uh, I disagree with Kagame's policy of murdering the opposition. He, his people tried to kill an opposition leader uh, in South Africa who was uh, an exile from Rwanda. Uh, they did succeed to kill another one uh, who they strangled and killed. I disagree completely with those methods. So R Rwanda, I wouldn't call it a role model. It's not a role model for us in Africa to follow. Murdering your opposition is not the role model we want. In Africa, we want everybody to be free to exp express their, pos their points of view without being murdered, which is what the Rwandan government does. The, so it's not a role model in that sense. Um, the um, opposing figures, have been murdered and killed or shot in America, in Britain, in the Western world. What is the difference? No, I don't think so. John F. Kennedy was killed. He Martin Luther King was, uh, was, yeah, was but, killed. But, but John F. Kennedy was not killed because he was opposing by the Republican Party. He was a Democratic president. It's still a mystery. It's, it, it's yeah, not been but, resolved in a way. But he wasn't killed by the Republican Party. <laughs> so you can't compare. America has a, a long history of assassinations of presidents uh, and, it and, does, civil rights, you know, and civil rights leaders. Yes. So it doesn't follow that, that, that it's okay for Rwanda to then kill opposition leaders. Coming back to Africa, uh, Tanzania. Well, I lived in Tanzania during the time of Nyerere. Mm -hmm. I worked there for three years. So you witnessed the whole Ujamaa uh, Yes, I, I witnessed the whole Ujamaa policy. philosophy. I was working in the construction industry. And, and in terms of the construction industry, Nyerere was very, very uh, important. In fact, I tried to help zanu to to learn from the experiments that uh, the, the initiatives that Nyerere uh, developed to develop the professions, the construction industry, like to develop architects and quant surveyors and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, unsuccessfully, the Zimbabweans didn't pay much attention, but anyway, I, I tried to explain to them how the Tanzania... Have South Africans paid attention? No, no, they no. haven't paid attention. <laughs> So, uh, but, but Nyerere was, I mean, Nyerere for me as a Southern African, yes, he was very key in our liberation. Yes, he was. He was very, was. very key. In terms of... So his, was, uh, to be fair, so was uh, Kenneth Kaunda. Oh, so was If Kaunda. these countries are poor today, it's because they've dedicated so much Absolutely. resources to the freedom of uh, 
there's no doubt, there's no doubt about that. But I did not agree with Yerera's economic policy of villagization, which is what he tried to, he dismantled the African, the natural African, mm -hmm. a rural a settlement, the village, which is village, a small village. hamlet, and tried to recreate the Asian Chinese type of, of, yeah, of, of large villages, but, but that failed. That failed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I did not agree with it. How was he as a leader? Did he, did he eliminate the, the opposition? No, no, no. no. Was Karume on the side of, of um, Nyerere or was yes, he was yeah. in the opposition? Uh, no, Karume was part of uh, Nyerere's party. Mm. But Zanzibar is, a, although it is part of Tanzania, it's a, it's a semi-autonomous region, yes. region. And so the Zanzibaris fighting amongst themselves Salim Salim was yes. part and it's of mostly, that. And mostly, largely Muslim. Yes, but the mainland has also got a big Muslim community. community. So, but politically, <coughs> there's relative political autonomy for Zanzibar. So the, 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 the political leadership in Zanzibar fought amongst themselves, which led to the death of Karume mm -hmm. and the, the arrest of Babu, who yes, was Babu. the main leader of the Zanzibari group at that time. But Salim Salim was involved in it, but uh, Nyerere chose not to, <laughs> to go pursue after, him. To go after him. But, <laughs> but none of them were, were actually yeah. killed. What would you say, well, we, we, then we touched on Botswana. You must comment on Botswana. Hasn't Botswana been economically successful? Yes, and Botswana. And politically stable? Well, Botswana, well governed. It, it is reasonably well governed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, the, the theorists of democracy say you don't have real democracy until a ruling party gets replaced by the opposition. Mm -hmm. That is the theorists. They are very close to that. <laughs> Botswana hasn't had that. It's been yeah, but they are very, the opposition has grown very, very strong. Yes, but it hasn't replaced the ruling party which has been in power since, I think, 1966, since independence yes. in Botswana. So, before we start making accolades about democracy in Botswana, you have to realize that they have one more step to take, which is that the opposition must come to power. Must also come to power. Then we can start to say the democratic process uh, has succeeded. Zambia has had that where MMD, Malawi, Malawi is, yes, yeah. Ghana, Ghana, Mauritius, Mauritius so, Nigeria. So, so, so Botswana hasn't reached past that hurdle yet. So the, the jury is still out on the stability of Botswana's democracy. I don't think uh, President Khan would be very happy hearing that. <laughs> I'm sure he won't be happy, but that's the reality. <laughs> What would you say are the pillars that African leaders and citizens need to focus on in order to move the continent forward? Well, there, really there are a number of pillars that we in Africa have to, have to focus on. Africa is a multi, African countries are multi-ethnic countries, multi-tribal countries. All of our countries were created by the colonialists. Whereas the colonialists in their home countries had essentially one ethnic group as making up their country. The French had the French, the Portuguese had the Portuguese, the English had the English. But in Africa, they, to suit their convenience, they brought different ethnics together and created South Africa or Zimbabwe. So, now to be able to manage this multi-ethnic environment, Democracy is very important because everybody has, has to feel that their voice is being held, heard. So that is a very critical factor for Africa. It's not for ideological reasons. It's for the stability of our own countries. Mm. If certain ethnic groups feel that their voice is not being heard, they are being marginalized, then you start a conflict environment. So the question of democracy in Africa is very central to the stability of our, of our own countries. Mm. So that's one point. The second point 
is the change of our economy. The African economies were started by the colonialists. Yes. The colonialists developed these economies or structured these economies for their own benefit, for the benefits of their own countries, not for the benefit of the African people. Mm. So we have to restructure our economies so that they benefit the African people. This isn't really happening in most African countries, including my own country, South Africa. So we, that's a huge challenge that we have to restructure uh, our economies. I would say those are the two primary challenges that, that the African countries have to overcome. Restructuring the economies so that they work for the interests of the African people rather than the former colonialists and small elites who, who, who are the successors to the colonialists and, and then democracy so that there is no tribe that feels I'm being pushed out, I'm being marginalized, I'm being left out. So you, to overcome that we need a very open, very functioning democratic process. Do you admire any of the early leaders that you admire? Well, in Africa, oh, in Africa. I admire a lot if of you, leaders. If, if, if you were to mention five, mm. who, who would they be? If I were to mention five in leaders, Africa, in Africa, yeah, yes. five Africa. Mandela, of Ta course. Uh, <laughs> Mandela would be one of them. Yes. Oliver Tambo, another. Nkrumah, another. Nasser would be another. Abdul Gama Nasser. Yeah. Uh, I think Haile Selassie. And Nyerere. So I've gone to see. So I aid Oniopia for Tawombeki. Well, I wouldn't put him in that. He <laughs> 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 very polite. What would you say are the guiding principles that steer your life? The guiding, well, I, I actually don't see my life as having to have guiding principles. That's it, and you know, I'm in private business. Mm -hmm. So I have to, and I'm also a, a journalist. So as a journalist, I have to be professional. And I have to, if I write an article, it has to be professionally writ written. So that is a guiding principle. As a business person, I have to run my companies in a way that the stakeholders benefit and that the company is profitable. So, I don't know if that answers mm. your question. But, but if, if you're one of a very few people, we, uh, a lot of people talk about this, um, who did not get embroiled you know, by um, a Keith and King coming to power. I mean, the way you carried yourself before the election of President Becky to office and the way you carried yourself during his governance and post-governance, almost, you know, nothing changed. Uh, but there must have been moments where there's great temptation because you are the president's brother. People come to you with all kinds of... Well, no, I how, never... How do you, so when we come about, when we talk about the guiding principle, how did you manage to, to stay the course? Well, you know, my family were, my grandfather was one of the people who put out the money in 1908 to build Fort Hill. Fort Hill. your grandfather? Yes, my not grandfather. Not your father? Not my father. My father was a student, became a student. Of Fort Hill. Of Fort Hill. Funded by your grandfather. But the university itself to establish, my grandfather was one of the people Good who God. put out the money. So from our family perspective and from my perspective, we have been builders of the ANC. Mm. I don't want anything from the ANC. My contribution was to contribute to build the ANC in order to achieve our objective. In terms of Forte, I'm sure my grandfather, if he were alive, he'd be very happy that Forte became a, a, an intellectual center for Eastern and Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. So the money he put into it was a success. He, did, he didn't want anything from Forte. He wanted it to succeed in contributing to the development of Africa. I don't want anything from the ANC or from the ANC government. I build my own businesses. Like all entrepreneurs, they succeed or fail. 
on the basis of their viability, yeah. you are not, giving not of, part of, of connections with the government. Yes. Who would you say the ANC is now what, 104 years? Yes, it was in 100 and it was in 1912. Yeah, 105 years old. 105 years old. Who would you say stands out as a, a leader? Is one or two of presidents or who were critical, pivotal in certain developments of the ANC as an organization? Well, uh, Blackie, uh, Saul Blackie, who wrote a famous book called Native Life in South Africa. He owned his own uh, newspaper, which was a Sotswana language newspaper. He was one of our very critical intellectuals. John Dube, who I have mentioned, mm -hmm. who, owned, who set up Langa La Senatal and, and Oshanga Institute, he was one of them. Uh, so we, we have a number of... The Nobel Prize winner? Uh, in course, uh, yeah. so the, the ANC has that was largely centered around what the uh, granting of the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, it was centered around I think the defiance campaign of the early 1950s. Where remember in the early 1950s in Africa, we had two very impo important armed struggles, mm -hmm. which was Algeria, yes, and Kenya, yes. The Mau Mau. The Mau Mau. Yes. Uh, and then the, and the National Liberation it. Front. Ben yeah. Bella, was it? Yeah, Ben Bella. Ben Bella yeah. Yeah. So, but the ANC at that time, which it could easily have started the armed struggle itself at the same time as the armed struggle in Kenya started and in Algeria started. But it decided to try to negotiate some more with the, with, with the oppressive regime. So it was related uh, you know, to, to, that, that, to, to finding a peaceful solution. Mm -hmm. More uh, or less like Martin Luther King and non-violence uh, solution. Yes, yes. Which the, didn't and Gandhi, and Gandhi. And Gandhi, yes. yes. Ended up with his mm. uh, own assassination. Yeah. We always want to ask for the benefit of our viewers and, and followers. Um, our guests, what they have learned from life. You still reasonably, you know, quite young. You still have another uh, 30, 40, you oh, know. Thank you, Jay. You, know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, activism in you. But what would you say you have learned from life so far? But, well, f for me, my most important lesson that I've learned from, from life is actually from the African countries. Mm. I spent nearly 10 years as a journalist in Zimbabwe. Uh, I worked for the Sunday Mail, with William Zambu. which was edited by a ZAPU, yes. a central committee man. I worked with uh, Sitole in the Herald, yes. who was a ZANU <laughs> So that was to me, and I worked with, uh, with ZANU in from when we were students in, some, in England in the yes. 60s and 70s, you know, Chan Chimutengwede, yes. all those guys. But I think talking of England, not a lot of people know that you were actually in the leadership structures of uh, the ANC in England. You were in the Youth Council, were, were Yeah, you? yes, I, I was uh, at some stage secretary of the ANC Youth and Students. Uh, when I was, but we, we were all active as students, yes. as African students, especially Southern African students, because our countries were fighting liberation wars. I mustn't lose my question, what you have learned <laughs> in life so okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> What I have learned uh, from, mainly from my African experience, is that you have to understand what your country, where your country is and what the aspirations of the people in your country and what their capabilities are, what they want to achieve and then work with that. Many people take theories from here, there and everywhere and, and they think they should make the, their populations, the African people, follow these theories. Actually, the African people have their own wisdom, otherwise they wouldn't have survived for thousands of years in this harsh environment of Africa. So, so to me, and that's what 
I, I learned from my, from, from my fellow Africans mm -hmm. and I've learned a lot from ZANU, I've learned a lot from ZAPU, I've learned a lot from TANU in Tanzania, from UNIP, from the trade unions in Zambia for example, from students, other African students in the United Kingdom and then of course most, one of the most important lessons for me were were the fiction writers, the African fiction writers. Mm. If you look at people like Chinua, Chebe, yes. Wole, Soyinka, uh, the, the African fiction writers, they warned us about where the leaders of liberation parties were going. Yes. Many of us didn't pay much attention. We thought they were Afro-pessimists. Yes. But actually they were right. Chinua Achebe was right when he warned us about the problems that our freedom fighters were, were going to lead us to. Who wrote when things fall apart? Yeah, it was Chino Achebe, 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 Nigeria, the yes. famous Nigerian, yes. uh, Nigerian writer. But Ngugi was younger. Yes, yes, he was well, here recently, he wasn't he? Dambuso Manachewa, well, I, I mean, one of my best friends when I was in Zimbabwe was Dambuso Manachewa. He died young, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. But his uh, House of Hunger is one of the best pieces of literature. Do you publish it? No, I have, we have, it was published, I think, by Heinemann, if I'm not mistaken. But it's a brilliant analysis of the relationship between the nationalist leadership and the mass of the African people, the, the dynamic of the relationship. Do you think uh, Steve Biko's successes are exaggerated? No, I, I think Steve Biko's influence was, was important uh, as a leader of students and of young people. Uh, many of the people who followed Steve Biko, like Mukosazan and Amini Zuma, for example, yes. uh, are now very important leaders in our country. Now I know who you're supporting. Well, <laughs> 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 it's been great talking to you. Great my regards to your family and Merry Christmas we'll to you. Do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for there you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, what an interview. Stay tuned in and we'll be back next week with another guest on Makamba Live. Goodbye.